So thank you so much for inviting me. It is a great honor and I'm terrified to be in the presence of all of you guys, <laughs> but uh, here we go. So a big goal in wisdom research is obviously to try to figure out the various factors that promote the development of wisdom. And as we've discussed today, wisdom is often thought of as a trait or personality characteristic which is developed over time and is relatively stable across different contexts. But as Dr. Grossman discussed earlier, these, even if there are individual baseline differences, there's also individual intra-individual uh, variability. So the extent to which wisdom or wise characteristics manifest themselves may vary or may depend on situational or interpersonal, or sorry, personal factors such as how stressed you are or how tired you are, um, of which I am both right now. <laughs> so today I want to explore one possible factor which is perhaps less obvious or intuitive, and that would be whether you're using a native versus foreign language. Now, if you're thinking about a potential language effect on wisdom, it might be intuitive to think that it would be that using a foreign language would actually reduce your capacity for wisdom because it's more cognitively taxing to use a non-native language and could therefore eat up all the resources that you need to make a wise choice. However, as much as that might be true, we suggest that it might actually promote wisdom in some respects as well. Past research has demonstrated that using a foreign language can actually lead to more normatively rational choices in some situations. So for instance, People using a foreign language are less affected by how a situation is framed or described and therefore make more consistent choices than those using a native tongue. Additionally, people using a foreign language are less likely to infer incorrect causal relationships between events relative to people using their native language. There are also effects that might be considered a little bit more emotional in nature. For instance, when people are presented with various uh, gambles that had positive expected value, people using a foreign language were less loss averse and were thus be better able to take advantage of these advantageous and lucrative bets. Um, additionally, this isn't necessarily more rational, but when presented with various um, potential hazards such as traveling by airplane or biotechnology, people using a foreign language actually perceive greater benefit and less risk relative to those using a native language. Um, while the exact mechanisms that's driving these various foreign language effects is not exactly determined yet, a leading candidate is that using a foreign language is less emotional than a native tongue. Um, while the native language is acquired through our various emotionally rich experiences in life, foreign languages are often acquired later in life, maybe in a less emotional classroom setting, and therefore when you're processing information in a foreign language, it may not be as tethered to the automatic emotional reactions that it's evoked by your native language. As such, when you approach situations in a foreign language, it may be with a cooler, perhaps more psychologically distant mindset relative to the native tongue. And in some situations, that may be more conducive to wise decisions. Now, it should be noted that while in some situations, being more or less emotional, having greater psychological distance might lead to greater wisdom, there might be other situations in which it might actually reduce wisdom as well. So, in order to test the potential effect of using a foreign language on these various components of wisdom, we adopted Dr. Ardell's three-dimensional wisdom scale. So as she already discussed, this includes three dimensions, which are reflective, cognitive, and affective, or compassionate. In the reflective condition, it's meant to measure the extent to which, pe extent to which people look at phenomena and events from many different perspectives to develop self-awareness and self-insight. So a person scoring low on this dimension might agree with a statement such as, I sometimes find it difficult to see things from another person's point of view. Now, to my knowledge, there has not been an experiment that directly assessed whether people using a foreign language are, in fact, better at taking perspective or are more self-aware. There are reasons to think that that could be the case. For instance, Dr. Grossman's research suggests that having greater psychological distance may increase wise reasoning, for instance, intellectual humility, uh, as well as behavior, presumably because having this distance allows you to transcend your more egocentric view. To the extent that using a foreign language is more psychologically distant than your native language, it's also possible that it may play a similar role and prompt a similar disengagement from the self. Uh, the next one is the cognitive dimension, which assesses a person's ability to understand life, which includes its inherent unpredictability, uh, ambiguity, and uncertainty. Um, so a person scoring low on that might agree with something like people are either good or bad. Now, this understanding relies heavily on the reflective dimension. And so if it's the case that using a foreign language increases the reflective dimension, it may similarly enhance the cognitive. Um, and there is data that seems to be somewhat consistent with this. Uh, Janet Gapel and her group demonstrated that when people were presented with various taboos, such as consensual incest or eating a dog, a dead dog, already dead dog, um, 
if that helps, um, <laughs> that people using a foreign language judge them both less harshly and were also less confident in their moral judgments of the action, which suggests that when you use a foreign language, you may have a less rigid value system, which may be more forgiving in ambiguous or uncertain situations. Lastly, there's the affective dimension, which assesses the extent to which people display positive emotions and behavior towards other beings, such as feelings and acts of sympathy and compassion. So scoring low on that might be something like, sometimes I don't feel very sorry for other people when they're having problems. Now, so far, we've suggested that using a foreign language may actually boost wisdom or produce higher scores for the cognitive and reflective dimensions, but we have reasons to think that that may not be the case for the affective dimension. Uh, as previously noted, people using a foreign language have been shown to be less emotional than those using the native tongue. And given that the compassionate uh, dimension is a very emotional process, it may be similarly dulled when using the foreign language. And indeed, we have evidence from different studies demonstrating that people using a foreign language score lower on the interpersonal reactivity index, which is meant to uh, capture empathic concern. So, in order to test these hypotheses, we presented the three-dimensional wisdom scale to a group of native English speakers residing in Chicago. So all of them were native English speakers who spoke Spanish as a foreign language, and we randomly assigned them to complete the survey either in English or in Spanish. Now, at this point, you might be thinking that even if language is able to prompt a momentary shift in the wisdom state um, of an individual, maybe it would not affect their responses on a scale, which is meant to assess overall past behavior. After all, if you were compassionate to people nine times out of 10 in the past, this record would not change regardless of whether you're currently using Spanish or English. So whether we see a language effect or not relies quite a bit on the processes which are involved when you actually complete the scale. If indeed you are having an objective view of your past and are trying to document your past behavior, then we would not expect to see a language effect even if there are actual momentary online shifts. On the other hand, if people are being swayed by how they would feel or how they would act right now when making their judgments, then we might expect to see a language effect even though it's traditionally considered a trait measure of wisdom. So this is what we found. When you collapse across the three uh, dimensions, overall, people using a foreign language scored higher or wiser uh, than those using the native language. Interestingly, there was the a marginal language by measure interaction such that those using foreign language scored higher specifically for the cognitive and reflective dimensions, but not the affective. Um, as you noted that we didn't find the predicted decrease in the affective dimension. So of course that could either mean that using a foreign language does not have an effect on the affective dimension, or it could be that something like an increase in the reflective dimension and a decrease in emotional processing basically canceled each other out. Uh, this data doesn't speak to which of these two is true, and so it's something that we would like to explore further in the future. Um, however, while this general pattern seems to be in sync with our predictions, it doesn't necessarily mean that this is a result of the foreignness of the language. One alternative hypothesis is that it has something to do with the language itself, that this is an English versus Spanish issue, that there's something about the Spanish survey that prompts wiser or higher scores on the wisdom scales. Um, and so to assess this possibility, we ran the experiment again, but this time in Barcelona with native Spanish speakers who spoke English as a foreign language. And unfortunately, this time we did not get an effect. <laughs> yeah, um, so as you can see, no difference between the native and the foreign across the three dimensions. Uh, it's notable that we don't see a reversal, which suggests that it's not necessarily about Spanish being a wiser language, um, but it does raise the question of why would you find it in one case and not in the other? So we have a couple ideas. One possibility is that the effective language may be moderated by the baseline level of wisdom. So as you may have noticed, the Barcelona group scored significantly higher than the Chicago group <laughs> on all three <laughs> dimensions, which I have no hypothesis for at this point, but we, there's that. <laughs> um, and that's the case for both the native and foreign language groups. Um, though there is a language by experiment interaction such that this Barcelona advantage is greater for the native speakers than the foreign speakers. Um, and so it might be the case that using a foreign language can boost scores only when the actual score is, the baseline score is relatively low and that it doesn't have much of an effect when people are already responding relatively high when using the native tongue. Another possibility is that the effective language is moderated by the foreign language proficiency. So, as you can see, the Chicago group is where we found the effect. They acquired the foreign language significantly later than those in the Barcelona group. They additionally rated their foreign language proficiency, and these are on seven point scales here, um, 
significantly, later, uh, significantly lower than the Barcelona group. Weirdly, they rated their native language proficiency as higher than the Barcelona group, which suggests it's not something about that group being more epistemically humble or something. Um, so when you look at the difference between the scores, those in the Barcelona group had a greater uh, difference between their native and foreign language proficiency relative to the Barcelona group. So it may be the case that as you become more proficient in the foreign language, you react to it more and more similarly as you would to a native language, which is what you would expect if basically what's being driven here, uh, what is driving this effect is a psychological distance from the foreign language. Um, and that's something that we should explore in future research. However, it does seem that using a foreign language can boost certain dimensions sometimes, but these mixed set of results perhaps raise more questions than they answer. So a few of the questions are obviously, why does using a foreign language affect wisdom in some cases, but not in others, and what is the role of proficiency? Another question is, does it actually increase wisdom, or is this an artifact of some sort? Does it really just make you respond to the scale differently when using a foreign language? Um, abstracting out a little bit, what does it mean for what are traditionally more trait-type measures of wisdom that they can be affected by the language? Um, and what does it imply about the processes involved in answering such surveys um, that it seems to be affected by language? So I look forward to discussing that with you and hearing your insights and would like to thank the Templeton Foundation and my wonderful collaborators and of course you for your time. Thank you. <laughs>the Barcelona uh, subjects trilingual, Catalan, Spanish, English? Not all of them, but many of them are, yes. So have that is a potential difference. Have you tried s looking at the bilinguals from the trilinguals? I have not. We actually just got the Barcelona ah. data in, but that's a great idea. We'll look at that. Yeah, that could be a difference. That was my question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, so, thank you. I really enjoyed this talk. So, I just had a couple of questions about the studies. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, did you ask any qu any questions in either study about proficiency, or did you, you did you just uh, and did you control for that in, in either study? Uh, and my second question has to do with: Do you know anything about how the wisdom measure performs in Spanish, and what translation procedure do you use to make sure that they were equivalent? Right. So uh, we did ask for proficiency at the end of the study. So that was a self-reported one to seven, where one is basically that you don't understand it, and seven is full fluency. Uh, we did not control for it when looking at the results. Okay. So that would be the next step. Mm -hmm. um, we actually used our own translation of the Spanish. I'm not aware if there is a Spanish version already out there. So we probably should have used that one <laughs> in retrospect. Um, <laughs> And so I'm actually not aware of how that one performs. Um, but what we did is our usual translation procedure, which is that we had a native speaker of Spanish first translated from English to Spanish, and then a bilingual translated back from Spanish to English, and then we matched the two English versions to make sure that they were comparable. Hi, um, really great topic. Um, so I'm gonna continue in the spirit of, um, you know, sort of like things that might explain the difference. And I'm wondering, why didn't you find somebody who are, say, Hispanic immigrants to Chicago, you know, and, um, but now speak English? <laughs> you know, I was like, th that seems like a very easy, I don't know how, but there seems like there should be quite a few. Or even people who are bilingual, but, you know, their native languages, you know, they, they spoke Spanish at home, you know, all their lives, but, you know, they, they're fluent in English. That's uh, a great so question. Mm -hmm. so, um, so one advantage of potentially using a group in Chicago is that we can then hold the context, the actual place that we're doing it steady. However, it would introduce a, next, a different variable in the sense that in both cases, in these two studies, the home language was also the native language. Whereas in that case, we would now be dealing with a different population where they're using English probably more frequently in their everyday lives and therefore may be more psychologically proximal, which is also similar to the another reason why we don't, we specifically screen out people who grew up speaking the foreign language because we are looking for people that do not have a strong emotional attachment or at least we don't expect would have a strong emotional attachment to the foreign language. No, but I'm saying for your Spanish group, so precisely like, you know, the, the people, uh, w wouldn't it be the case, you know, if you grew up speaking Spanish at home and I've actually many times uh, I grew up in Quebec, so I, <laughs> I have the feeling that a lot of people could speak Spanish a lot of times uh, during the day, <laughs> even if they're quite fluent. So their, their strongest emotional connection would be to Spanish, but they also know English. So it seems like they would be a, a, a more, you know, a clearer match to the, to the English-speaking people who also learn Spanish as a second language. 
You see what I'm saying? They're, they would have a more emotional connection to Spanish. Isn't that what you're looking for? Oh, it is. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, I mean, you're basically talking about people who use both languages pretty frequently in their daily lives, right? Well, I mean, but there could be people that live in Spanish, I'm just guessing, but there could be areas of Chicago that are predominantly Spanish where people spend most of their day speaking Spanish, uh, but of course they know English. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, we could do that. And an advantage of that would be that we initially had the survey translated, I didn't mean to mention this, translated by a um, South American speaker. Um, and then we had to adapt it slightly for Barcelona because the Spanish speakers have a slightly different Spanish. So in this case, it would have been a much more comparable uh, comparison. Yeah. But anyways, it's a terrific uh, question. I really love the idea that it, it adds a certain distancing um, so maybe you could speak to that. Is, are you taking that to be a sort of mechanism? That um, and what would that accomplish? Do you think? Um, right. So we have taken that to be the driving force of many of our past studies. So, for instance, we have a number of different foreign language effects. Specifically, more the most robust effects seem to be in the moral domain. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, when people are presented with moral dilemmas, such as it was mentioned earlier, the crying baby, whether you suffocate them or not. When people <laughs> are presented with these types of dilemmas, they are more utilitarian when they're using a foreign language than a native language. And we think that it's probably a similar mechanism is what I'm proposing here, such that when you process this scenario in the foreign language, it doesn't evoke the same kind of visceral negative reaction as it does in your native tongue. And as such, you're be better able to consider other things like the utilitarian concern of saving a greater number of lives. Yeah. So, uh, and thanks for a nice presentation. In San Diego, we have been doing several studies in Latinos, not wisdom related, but, there, but some sort of common issues that come up is level of acculturation. And so there are some acculturation scales it is useful to give uh, in study like this. The issues about how long they have been in US or in San Diego, uh, what generation of migrants it is. So when did they start learning the other language? So all of those issues actually also are related to how well they do, um, independent of wisdom itself. Yeah, I think that would be great to look at. So in this study, we actually asked for, so in addition to the proficiency ratings, we asked for age of acquisition. And um, I believe we also asked for how long, or what percentage of the time they spend speaking the foreign language in various contexts, for instance, with family and friends, watching TV, and so on and so forth. Uh, we haven't looked at the relationship of those measures yet, but we have looked at um, proficiency and age of acquisition. So I didn't get to this, but the proficiency story is also complicated. <laughs> um, so for experiment one, this on the x-axis here, this is the difference between the native and the foreign language. So larger means basically they're lower proficiency in the foreign language. Uh, and this is their total wisdom score. So as you can see, for the, the Chicago sample, it seems like there's a positive relationship uh, such that people actually became wiser as they were lower in proficiency in the foreign language, um, which seems consistent with the idea of what I was discussing earlier, which is that you know basically what's driving this boost in wisdom is this distancing from the language. The strange thing in this case, though, is that you see this effect for both people who are using the foreign language as well as those who are using the native language. Uh, normally, you would not expect that to be the case for the people using the native language since they're not using the language that they're rating. Um, and so one really post hoc explanation for this finding might be some sort of epistemic humility explanation that maybe they're not actually worse at the foreign language, but that people who are generally wiser are also those who are going to be a little bit more relaxed about rating their foreign language proficiency. Um, so that's And then when we look at the same thing for experiment two, we find the opposite. Um, so in this case, this is the group that did not find the overall effect of language. We find no effect for native, which is what we were expecting all along. But for those using the foreign language, basically people were more wise as they were more proficient in the foreign language. Um, and so that seems more consistent with a cognitive load sort of explanation that essentially at a certain level, maybe the psychological distance no longer provides the boost but the increased cognitive load of using the foreign language now hurts you. Again, very post hoc, hand wavy. Um, but we did look at that. Age of acquisition did not have any effect on wisdom, um, but we should also look at other things such as how long they spent in the foreign country and so on and so forth. Yes. 
So this is really cool stuff, and I mean, I, I'm a great fan of this work, both uh, here and in Barcelona. Um, so I will not be too critical of it. <laughs> <It's a small laughs> Thank sample. you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 I, I think just some suggestions, because this is still sort of uh, early onsets. Um, the idea of emotions uh, and down-regulation of emotions by talking in a foreign language it's certainly an interesting one, but I wonder if a more parsimonious explanation here that is kind of along the same lines is the one that uh, there is an experiential component that you sort of have this experiential route of processing these JDM tasks uh, in a sense that, you know, you just do what you would normally do and how you feel and how, do, how should you react. Well, unless you like really work through those problems, you'll just, how do I feel? Mm -hmm. It's not really about your emotions Right? It's not like that, oh, yeah, I'm so deeply invested into this hot, uh, hot, game, uh, hot hand dilemma. Right. Oh, how should I do this now? This is not how people, I mean, in fact, for most of those JDM tasks, you have no feelings whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really more about, well, how do I generally, what's my gut feeling? Right? And uh, that, may, that process may be interrupted. By the way, if you're interested in that, so uh, Lisa Lippi and Richard Eibach have a very nice review. Uh, it's more like visual perspective taking, but it really applies, and uh, I think it, um, it works well here. Uh, so, so it's just a suggestion. So it, it, instead of thinking about it in terms of emotional downregulation, uh, in fact, because maybe there's not much to downregulate in the first place, there's just some less experiential route, or uh, it's interrupted as a different type of experience. Now, that may also help to possibly, I mean, there's so many, like if you have zero finding, uh, for you, there are 20 different explanations you can have mm -hmm. for, for why Spanish in Barcelona, maybe it's because they're Catalan, maybe it's because they're trilingual, maybe because Barcelona is a very cosmopolitan city, and maybe because Pampo Fabri University is a, a very sort of, uh, very cosmopolitan university where half the people speak English, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's hard, uh, but maybe one thing to consider, and I, I tried to push Albert towards that, but somehow, uh, <laughs> No to Albert. really, <laughs> yeah, it's hard to push <laughs> Albert, uh, seriously, uh, it, it is to really do more experimental work where you measure, for instance, the degree of deliberation, that the amount of time people spend on the task, so do it in the lab instead of in the classroom, how it's normally done, right? Uh, because then you can really rule out some of the hypothesis. For instance, you can rule out that this is not just because when you talk in the foreign language, maybe here people spend more time deliberating on the task, whereas, uh, in, um, uh, whereas in the native language they don't, and maybe in Barcelona they just don't care, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, so, so those type of things I think like I would really encourage you to sort of just, just take on and do more careful uh, experimental work in the lab because I think this kind of the degree to which they deliberate, I is it just like a, a spontaneous experiential uh, thing or is it about sort of, oh, take a step back, oh, what am I doing now? This is in a foreign language. Uh, I don't know what to do. Uh, and, and then, of course, there's whole th sorts of things with response biases and how Spanish respond differently to questions in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that's something to control for um, that may need to be accounted for. Because sometimes, for instance, I know from cross-cultural work, uh, you don't control for it, then you find very different results than when you control for response bias. So it's like people just, uh, Spanish are more extreme on, in their responses. So you see here right. that they're just giving high scores, yeah. and that may just be a side effect of them um, just responding on everything higher. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of great points there. Um, uh, sorry. So no, 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 no. I'm just trying to help you. I'm not being passive aggressive. There's actually a lot of good points there. <laughs> <laughs> so. For instance, the emotion thing. Uh, that's almost just me being uh, cheap and quick and dirty when I'm just describing this, but I completely agree with you. So when we're talking about the moral dilemmas, that's a case in which it seems very intuitive to use this emotional explanation because it's very emotionally aversive for people to think about killing a baby, for instance. But you're right, then in many of our experiments, it's not a very emotional task. So it's really more of a reduction in system one kind of automatic heuristic processing rather than necessarily a reduction in emotional reactions. Um, and uh, there are reasons other than just not having as many emotional associations with it where that would be the case. For instance, you know, there's research showing that increased processing disfluency can lead you to 
basically process things a little bit more carefully, more systematically. And so when you're processing a more difficult language, it slows you down and therefore perhaps you don't rely on your default, as you said, as much. So I completely agree with that. Um, and there was something else I wanted to discuss. I forgot what it was. It was right before, shoot. Oh, Albert, <laughs> right. <laughs> so <laughs> let's talk about Albert. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> so the it's getting filmed. Oh, yes. <laughs> we love Albert. <laughs> the Hi, Albert. issue here. <laughs> The issue here is that we often talk about whether this is a reduction in system one kind of emotional processing or an increase in more deliberative system two processing. And I think what you were saying was that by perhaps taking measurements of reaction time or something like that, we can try to maybe tease those two apart or have some sort of evidence that it's actually increased deliberation. Um, measuring reaction time is very tricky with this type of research because things are inherently going to take longer when you're processing it in a foreign language. Um, we could probably try to control for reading time and all that to try to get around that to some degree. Um, but we did try to sort of answer this system one, system two question um, in the moral domain recently using a process association approach, which is usually or has originally been used for memory research. But essentially, we were able to tease apart whether people were actually less deontological when using a foreign language or more utilitarian when using a foreign language. Um, and you know, if you don't tease them apart, basically they look like the same thing, that they're both more willing to kill the baby, essentially. Um, but we wanted to know whether that's because they are less system one or more system two. And based on our research, it looks like it's that they are less system one, if anything. Um, so I don't know whether that effect would translate to other, from the moral domain would translate to our other effects, but it does seem like the type of study that we should be doing in order to try to tease apart the mechanism a little more clearly. Yes. I, I think it's quite interesting. I mean, I would never have thought I'd to do a study like this, but you know, I think it's really interesting. Um, and you might have said it, but I've just, I, I missed it. Um, how, how did you recruit the participants in the two countries? Right, so this was more or less convenient sampling in the sense that we chose languages that we had access to. Um, so in the Chicago campus, this was part of a different study, and so we went to Spanish classes, high-level Spanish classes, uh, and recruited there. They passed an initial screening test to make sure that they were actually able to do a test like this in a foreign language. Um, and then that's what they did here. And then in Barcelona, it was similarly recruited from the Pompeo Fabra campus and they passed an initial uh, language screening test to make sure that they were actually able to do it in, in English. And do you have, do you have any data, I mean, in terms of are they similar in age? Are they similar in socioeconomic backgrounds, things like this? That's a good question. We don't know about SES. Age, uh, Barcelona was a little bit older. And that could have something to do with it. You know, first of all, they're a little bit older. They are more, more comfortable in the English language, probably, than the speakers here. You know, if you, it's that, I mean, for here, right. it's really a second language, whereas you know, coming from Europe, you know, you're basically inundated with the English language. You know, you have all the music in English, and then, you know, right. maybe, and I don't know if they dub this, their television shows in, in Spain, you might, but they might not, right? Mm -hmm. And whereas here it's really a second language, you Absolutely. know, so in this, and all of this could have something to do with it, you know, because what I really was concerned about that the scores were so low for the Chicago sample. It was very low. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's <laughs> uh, very unusual, you know. <laughs> yeah, and these are, you know, <laughs> smart happening? University of Chicago <laughs> kids, so I was surprised by that as well. And, and I don't know if it has something to do with socioeconomic state, status or anything, or I don't know, right? Mm. I mean, it's just, it, it's normally when, when I do this, you know, with my kids in, in Florida, it, it's at least the low, uh, higher than three, you know, and on right. average. So yeah. what's happening? That's a good <laughs> I question. Know. I don't know. Um, as I said, these are University of Chicago students, so I don't think they're <laughs> badly off. Right, exactly. um, so I don't know what their justification is for their behavior. Um, but that's a good question. Yeah. And But I absolutely agree that the Barcelona sample probably had a lot more daily exposure to mm -hmm. uh, English. And so if there was going to be one sample where it didn't work, that's the one where I would predict it. Mm -hmm. So it could be about the psychological distance to some degree. I just have one, one quick question. Have you looked at people who 
have a foreign language versus those who don't? Is there metapragmatic knowledge or metacognitive knowledge that learning a second language simply has that you don't get um, if you never learned a second language? That's a great question. Um, so we have not looked at that personally. And I'm not aware of research, maybe you would know better, for this particular scale among monolinguals versus bilinguals. But there are a host of other advantages that have been found among bilinguals, among them being inhibitory control, as well as uh, Boaz Kazar has you know, recently found that even children who are exposed to a foreign language have greater uh, perspective taking abilities relative to those who have no exposure to a foreign uh, to a second language, for instance. Um, so I expect that there probably would be a boost. Also, there's stuff on uh, bilingualism and creativity, for instance, which I think would probably be relevant to wisdom as well. And, and so that would explain the absolute differences between your Barcelona population and your Chicago population. Um, well, much. it could. So if the Barcelona population is indeed trilingual in the sense that they have two fluent languages and English is their foreign language and that extra language give them a, gave them a boost, then that could be the case. Um, however, English was a foreign language for them, um, just as Spanish was a foreign language for the Chicago sample. So in that case, they're matched, I think, relatively, well, they're higher proficiency in Barcelona. But yeah, that extra language might have done something. Thank you.